that um, has a lot of original uh, material and research, and um, it took a long time to put together a lot of a lot of years of research, but. Um, it's, uh, it's very interesting because it gives a different perspective than perhaps what is known about Bolaño because it gives some of this, this documentation that's kind of been missing. Um, but I'll, I'll go kind of now to talk a little bit about the book <laughs> um, and then kind of open it for questions. It would be nice for it just to be, you know, just to talk. Um, the book, um, I started the book, it, it took about five years to put together. It was a very uh, lot of work. A lot of work because um, the writers that, uh, maybe there's, there's a certain ambition in the type of um, writers that I was looking for and um, the, the basic premise of the book really. What I wanted to do was to, to do a, a best of the best. But I wanted to do a best of the best, not because that's what the critics say, but uh, I want to know what the best of the best is because that's what the best feels is the best. In other words, I wanted to find a space, an, a very intimate and private space, that the best writers uh, are willing to share about their own work. Um, I, did, I didn't want to know, I already know perfectly well what many people think is Mario Vargas Llosa's best work. I know what people think Carlos Fuentes' best work is, but what do they think about their own work? I was interested in, in kind of exploring um, or making a, a ma an intimate map of the literature of the, 20th, the second half of the 20th century in Spanish. But as I was saying earlier, um, I've been, I've found that my life <laughs> um, followed an odd trail that brought me to become a sort of bridge between Spanish and English. Um, I went to Spain very early on and, uh, and started working there, as I said before. Um, and so I, I realized that in the beginning, when I started working on this book, I was really thinking about an American audience, not about a Spanish audience so much. And, and, and in a minute, I'll explain um, how that gave a, a few kind of interesting points to the book, too. But this, this anthology actually comes after an American anthology that I came across first. It's called This Is My Best. And it's an anthology um, that was done uh, in Dial Press by a man named John Penn. The, the original idea comes from a man named John Penn who did This Is My Best with American writers during the 40s. The, the actual um, book came out in 1942. Now, the fr in the introduction in the very beginning, he says, unfortunately, Gertrude Stein and T.S. Eliot weren't able to be a part of the, the, the book because it was 1942 and they were in Europe and they couldn't get their things over, right? So, so we're talking about a vastly different world even though it wasn't <laughs> that long ago. Um, but also he decided to add um, the, 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 book, the book's ambition was much greater. He added poets, he added essayists, he added um, 150 different writers. But what it did was kind of celebrate literature in a moment that was particularly diff difficult for the world. You know? Everything was being destroyed and literature is an act of creation. So, so he brings these writers together and asks each one of them the question of, what do you consider your best pages? So he asks Hemingway, Steinbeck, Mencken, uh, Dorothy Parker, William Saroyan, Pearl S. Buck, um, John Dewey, uh, all of the great, William Carlos Williams, uh, all of the great writers of that period are in that book. And when I came across it by chance in a, in a library in a s tiny town in North Carolina, I was floored because I thought this is such an amazing piece of literary history. And it's not literary history according, again, to what the critics or academy, academia thinks. It's the writers themselves talking about that one obsession that repeats and creates an entire work or that one most, that highest moment or that greatest challenge that they've had or some kind of personal relationship with some 
little piece of writing they have that maybe is just a heart thing and not a head thing, you know? But that's what this, this, uh, this book offered, was like a, a walk, a secret walk through the forest of letters. So, so when I saw that, I, I was very inspired. I thought that we should do this in the Spanish language. That would be fantastic. And it would be a wonderful way for me, as an American, to share with the American audience all of the things that I know, or all of the people that I've read in the Spanish that that you know haven't come yet to uh, to be translated, or that have, but give a different perspective. So that's what that's what the the base idea of the book was. Um, but then, uh, so I started working, and I had been. Uh, the editorial director of uh, an imprint called Alfaguara, which is uh, the publisher of Javier Marias, of uh, you know Vargas Llosa, Fuentes. So I'd worked with a number of the authors, so they already knew me. So it was kind of an odd idea to many people, many writers, kind of thought, what are you, what are you talking about, my best pages? Um, so it was hard to get, at first it took a lot of explaining, and luckily I had already had some relationships, and I got, the first people on board for the, for the anthology were Vargas Llosa, Javier Marias, and uh, Antonio Munoz Molina. Those were the three first. And so if you get them, kind of like a lot of other people say yes. But a lot of them made me chase <laughs> for years. I had to chase and chase. And there's a certain kind of like Baroque protocol sometimes in the Spanish language that like they really want to, but you have to ask enough times before they're actually going to say yes. <laughs> so, so I knew that, you know. So I, I had to. One of the people who made me like chase the most was Carlos Fuentes, actually. Um, but Carlos Fuentes' father had a copy of the American anthology in his library, so he knew it. He knew the anthology, and he, in, like, kind of in the very beginning, he mentioned that to me to let me know. Keep asking, I will eventually. So, and luckily he did just in time because um, he died very shortly after our interview. Um, and I, I had one of the last, if not the last, interview that he gave in life. So, um, that for me, um, I was very sad, of course, to see him go, but I kind of felt like I got it, but I got what he thought was his best work, the example of his best work. Because one of the things that, I had this idea kind of a while ago, but what really spurred me was the death of um, Guillermo Cabrera Infante, who, uh, who I was close to, and it just pained me that I hadn't like gotten myself started in time for that. So, um, and, and so the, the requirements for, for this, um, or, or I should say what I was looking for for this was to find the greatest writers, but the writers who likely would not be writing better pages than what they already have because obviously I wanted this anthology to like last in time, to be a testament of a period of time in Spanish language li literature that was particularly uh, ebullient. Um, but there was, a, there was a period of time when, for some reason, Spanish language literature, it was almost as if after the boom generation, um, like American interest in Spanish language literature had been satiated, and so people weren't weren't really it wasn't being translated so much anymore. So I wanted to remember like that that generation of writers and give kind of remind the American audience what what the great writing that is in the language and why it needs to be translated and they shouldn't lose sight of what's what's going on in the language. And of course, um, I had already worked also with the younger generation because we did the Spanish, the Granta's um, Best of Young Spanish Language Novelists. So I, ha I had, you know, that younger generation we had already kind of looked for and, and, and figured it out. And, and I saw the reactions uh, of the people, you know, to that issue, which was fantastic. And I kind of noticed that it, it seems like translation is coming back in the United States and there's like a lot more interest and it's, it's very exciting actually. But so I had, I started the, the anthology, started it in English. I did my interview with Javier Marias and with um, Antonio Munoz Molina in English 
because they wanted to speak English for it. They didn't want it to be translated, but they wanted to show off their English, which is very good. But, um, but then I had to jump in, uh, for many reasons. I realized that because of my, my job, I was uh, running a, a startup publishing house, um, I couldn't give the amount of time that it was obvious this, this type of a project needed um, and give it to, to another imprint and in English. So I had to do it in Spanish and do it for the imprint that I was working in. So all of a sudden everything changed and we did it in, in Spanish first. And I have a, there was a, there's a um, good amount of people who, uh, you know, this, this book came with a lot of people um, helping me and working and uh, putting together, kind of putting our heads together. And, and so I, I want to thank all of those people too. Um, who, who helped, particularly Sandra Pereja and, and Juan Pablo Roa. I promised I would always mention their names because they helped so much. Um, but, so, so we started the process again, but in Spanish. And it's fun, funnily enough, when I went back to Javier Marias and uh, Munoz Molina to say, well, we're doing it in Spanish now, so can we do the inter interview again? They both said, no, translate it. <laughs> so I had to translate Munoz Molina into Spanish and Javier Marias, which was very, really quite, quite a bit of fun, actually, because then, of course, it had to pass their test. So they were just giving me a little bit of a hard time. But um, so each one of, uh, each one of the writers here, um, there are a few younger ones, um, Evelio Rosero and Horacio Castellanos Moya were two of the younger ones um, included. Um, and they will probably write better pages. And Enrique Villamata was included. There are uh, other kind of writers that are very, very active. But I did get a number of writers in um, before they passed. And I asked two questions. And the idea was to ask two questions to a number of people that allows you kind of a contrast. You have the same people answering the same question, uh, different people answering the same question. So it gives you a very nice kind of variety of ways that people approach their own work. And then at the same time, I organized it chronologically. The reason why I did that was so there, there are like a number of secondary and secondary readings that, that the anthology gives. Um, and one of them is the back and forth between Spain and Latin America in exiles, one way or the other way. The Spanish Civil War and the <coughs> period of difficulties of the dictatorships in Latin America. So you really kind of get to see the, the movements between, like the transatlantic movements that the writers made. And also that leads to the idea of exile and how much the exile of many writers had played a very determining role in, in a number of them. And s uh, most of these writers, they're, they're very important writers. They're, the, uh, they're the, the, they've won the most important prizes. But a number of them, um, a lot of people didn't know. They're kind of secret writers. And if you look at the secret writers, it, many of them are the exiles. They were kind of you know, taken from their readerships and their natural places, and, and re, re, uh, they, they had to re to move to other places, and, and that always causes a lot of difficulties with um, with these writers being recognized and having their work recognized. Because you have a writer like Jose de la Colina, who's in Mexico, but he's actually a Spanish writer, which makes him not eligible for for all of the prizes or the grants or the et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing. So the first question I asked was, what are your best pages? I, in general, asked for 15. Nobody gave me 15. Always give me many more than 15. <laughs> um, and the second one was, who are your de departed? ¿Quiénes son tus difuntos? And that comes from a sonnet that Quevedo wrote, <coughs> which is talking about how when writers are in the quiet of their room writing, they're in touch with the dead writers that have gone before, the classic writers. So by asking them, who are your classic writers, it gives you a good idea of, of where they're coming from, what their, what, their, what their ambition is, and who they're talking to um, when they're writing, their tradition, 
the whole thing that comes behind them. And I didn't want the contemporary writers, I wanted the classic writers. So, um, interestingly enough, the writer most cited by all of the, the, the writers that are here is Faulkner, which I think I find absolutely amazing because we know how deeply Faulkner influenced the boom generation. That's, that's well documented and well known. But I hadn't realized how much he also uh, affected and influenced the Spanish writers also. And the interesting thing about Faulkner is Faulkner had to go through Paris to be recognized again in the United States because Faulkner wasn't recognized in the United States for a long time. But when he was translated into France and he became a heroic figure in France, all of a sudden in the United States, people said, oh, we have to reconsider who, who Faulkner was, who our author is, right? Well, one of the interesting, the third thing that I can say that kind of came interestingly out of this, the, these conversations is Paris the central role that Paris played in Latin American fiction. And so of course these writers, the boom writers and other writers were in Paris and Paris was talking about Faulkner. So it's like to me that just show, goes to show how important it is, how important translation is, how important it is that we keep this conversation because without Faulkner, you know, there, a number of different languages wouldn't ha have had you know, the types of uh, great writers that, that came out of their languages. And, you know, and uh, I'm sure you can, if we want to go, we can follow that one all the way back from where Faulkner was getting his, his. but um, translation is absolutely fundamental and, and translation often comes when, um, when cultures kind of find that they've, uh, they've come to a, a certain point where uh, they're talking to themselves. T.S. Eliot from Goethe uh, said that a culture um, that doesn't translate ends up talking to themselves and, and becoming bored with, with themselves. No? So um, Paris was where a lot of Latin Americans went. As a matter of fact, Mario Vargas Llosa uh, comments that when he was in Paris, he, that was when he actually started reading other Latin American writers. Because at the time that, that he lived in Peru, Borges hadn't arrived in Peru yet. And as a matter of fact, in Spain, Borges was, in, was published after Vargas Llosa was published. So Borges hadn't, hadn't been in Spain yet either. So uh, when, when he went to Paris, he had the opportunity to meet and to know other writers of Spanish. So Paris became that place that kind of co co uh, brought them all together. Um, and from there, of course, we all know the boom generation that spent time in Barcelona. But there was also in here you find a, a number of Argentine writers like um, Aurora Venturini or Edgardo Kozerinsky who spent their entire lives practically in, in Paris. Um, but, uh, so, well, what I could do is maybe um, I could read a little bit. Would you like me to read? A little bit. Um, just uh, I'll, what I could do is perhaps read um, a little bit from Javier Marias. 